What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. If you're new around here, I'm Uncle Reddit, and this is our slash Tales from Tech Support. Had a lot of people asking me lately, uh, where are the cats? Where are the cats? Well, we took that, you know, week and a half or so and went camping, and ever since we've been back, their schedule's all out of whack, so they're they're here, they're, uh, and they do come back to the room in the evenings, but usually when I'm recording lately, they just don't. They're cats. They do what they do. All right, let's get started. There's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. Network technician for corporate weirdos. Clients just build out a brand new office space. Ultra modern. Everything sleek. Decked in the proper corporate grayscale for maximum soul suckage. Truly a wonder. Oops, slight problem. No space for the monster workstations the end users need. Apparently nobody told the interior designers that desk space was needed for full towers. Whatever can we do? Oh, say the desktop guys. We can put thin clients on the desks and have the end users VPN to their real machines, which will leave in stacks in the IDFs. Client agrees. Oops, slight problem. Nobody kitted out the IDFs to power hundreds of kilowatt monster workstations. Electricians' eyes twinkle. Their wallets fatten. PSUs are added and the amperage upped. New racks are installed. Everything gets dumped in the IDFs. Don't worry, this will be a temporary solution until we phase out these workstations. Sure, Jan. Oops, slight problem. Desktop guys don't have access to the IDS to service the machines. Client won't let them. Only network guys are allowed in. Very important, very secure. Okay, now the network guys have the responsibility for maintaining all the workstations since they're in their space. Oops, slight problem. Desktop guys have a contracted SLA of five minutes to solve issues. Network guys have a contracted SLA of 24 hours. End user can't remote to his machine? Call again tomorrow. But hey, the desks look pretty. Yeah, so they've spent thousands upon thousands of dollars, I'm sure, getting this temporary solution to work after spending all the money to get the place built out. And now they're going to end up spending thousands upon thousands more to correct the screwed up temporary solution. Genius. User thanked me for not making them feel stupid. Webcam not working. That and a room number is all I had to work with. Popped my head in to find the office empty. Sat down at their laptop, logged in, opened the camera app, and slid the cover off the webcam. It was working. Fixed, I told myself as I shook my head. As it was another slow day, I decided to do a bit more testing. Five minutes I had confirmed the webcam worked in different browsers and teams. Went back to my lair and typed up the ticket with the following text. Note, not the actual text, but something close enough. Hello, I had a look at your webcam, performed some testing and maintenance, and it seems to be working. During my tests, I noticed the protective cover of the webcam was on. This is really easy to miss on the laptop model you have. Just make sure the little slider above your cam is to the right if you want to use it. Please test and let me know if the webcam is working as intended. Kind regards, Turbo Jelly. Later, when coming back to lunch, said user stopped me to thank me for the email. She told me she appreciated how I explained the issue without making her feel stupid. It felt good. Yeah, in most cases, 90% of the cases, there's no reason to bash the end user at all. Uh, make them feel bad, guilty, stupid, whatever. The only time that I agree with making somebody feel stupid and small in any way is when they start getting cocky and mouthy. I will torture those people until they cry. No, they can't look that up. Don't worry, they can look that up. Currently, I work a pretty thankless job as a remote service desk tech. It's a work from home position where I handle calls and emails from users from a company we're contracted out to to help resolve users issues. Some backstory to my story. We have a policy at work to collect and document as much info as possible in tickets because when we send those tickets to other places, they'll need that info to help in a lot of cases. In particular, I've gotten chewed out a few times by my manager for not documenting user desk location. It's apparently very important that I collect this info from the user and record it in a ticket before I send it to on-site support, because if they don't get that info from the ticket, they won't know where to go. Now after one case of me just not knowing what I was doing here, still pretty new, less than two months, and a few of me just forgetting, I try and get that info where possible. Today's story, I get a call from a frantic user. The whole call is less than five minutes. They basically screwed with the setup at their desk and now their laptop 
dock, monitors, and peripherals are not behaving exactly the way the user needs them to. So they called in and asked that I send someone to their desk to sort it out immediately. I tried to collect as much info as possible, but they left off very quick to go attend a meeting, barely staying on long enough to get their ticket number for the call and my advice for them to call back later if no one fixes their desk setup. The user was pretty specific in asking multiple times that on-site people need to go fix their stuff, so I have to ask about escalating. Man equals manager, me equals me, obviously. Me. I'm pretty sure this is a no, but I just got off with a user that made multiple requests for on-site to fix hardware setup at their desk. Manager. Yeah, that's going to be a no, especially with no attempted fixing on our end. Me. Alright, well, they're at least primed to call us back so we can maybe try to fix later when they have more time. I didn't even get their desk info, they left so quick. Manager. Oh, that's alright. On-site support will be able to look up that info in the ticketing system for that user's profile. You what? Oh. Oh, they can just do that, huh? They're perfectly able to look up user's location info, and I've been chewed out multiple times on that why exactly. My day just started, and I'm already considering calling it quits over this. I even had to scroll up in the chat history just to see where this same person had last told me that I needed to collect that info because on-site isn't able to look it up. Grumbling sailor talk. I can understand requesting that you add that into the tickets. It's, it's nice to have as much information as possible, but if you miss it, you miss it. Or if the person jumps off the phone too fast and you can't do anything about it, then okay, now the other techs have to look it up and go from there. I'm not sure in this day and age why it's that critical, especially when in this particular instance they can look up the user's profile and get their location. Just weird. On-call person has tried nothing, but still it's my fault it isn't working. I work at a small energy company and deal with a lot of regulating equipment on a daily basis. We have one rotating on-call person that is responsible to fix any problem that arises outside office hours. However, due to the small size of the company, some of the on-call people mainly work in different areas than they are on call for. If it's a simple problem, they usually solve it, but if they can, it's accepted to call for help from someone that isn't on call. This usually means me since I know the equipment like to help and it's much easier to get a hold of than my boss after hours. The story happened about a year ago when one of the non-proficient people were on call. It's 3 o'clock in the morning on Monday and I woke up to the tone of my work phone ringing. It's the on-call person and this week it's one of those that specialize in different areas. Me, newly awake, hello, how can I help you? On call, I have problem X at location Y and can't solve it. Me. Okay, that's a bit unusual. What have you tried? On call. I can fix it from home, but it just returns every hour or so. My wife is really mad that she can't get any sleep. I've been up for the entire night. Me. That sounds a bit like an electric relay that's starting to fail. Have you checked electrical equipment? On call. That's what I thought too. Me. And have you checked it? If it's a failing relay, it's very easy to fix. On call. No, I haven't been to location Y despite it being a five minute drive from his house. I thought it would be unsafe to start checking electrical equipment alone in the middle of the night, so I hoped it might survive until Monday morning, but the frequency of alarm is increasing and I can't get any sleep. Me. How long have you been having these troubles? On call. It started Saturday morning and the frequency has been ever increasing since then. Now it's like 30 minutes between alarms. Can you come to location Y so we can look at this together? I don't think it's safe to do alone in the middle of the night. Me. First, let me just get this straight. You've known about this problem since Saturday morning, done nothing to try to fix it for the entire weekend, and not called anyone for help during reasonable hours despite increasing frequency, and then decide it was better to wake me than the on-call electrician despite suspecting it to be an electrical fault? And on top of this, it's somehow my fault that you and your wife can't get any sleep because my equipment is failing? Some sort of an apology about how it isn't my fault but still is my fault that I don't remember. Me. Well, I'm already awake, so there's no need to wake up the electrician too. If you think it's unsafe to do this work alone in the middle of the night, I'll meet you in Location Y in 15 minutes and we can do it together. When I arrive at Location Y, we identify the problem within 10 minutes. It was indeed a faulty relay, and since we had spares available, it was fixed in minutes. On call said thank you, complained a bit more about how his wife is mad and that she don't think he should be on call anymore, and then we go home to sleep. The next day, the on-call person complains to my boss about how it's too much work to be on call and that his wife is really mad at him, and that's our fault. 
My boss tries to explain to him how it isn't our equipment's fault, that his wife is mad at him when he just ignored a recurring problem for a weekend. I'm unsure if the on-call person truly accepted that, but he didn't make any more fuss about it. Okay, there's two problems here. <clears throat> One, this guy's lazy. I can tell right from the tone of the whole thing. If that's really what happened, then the on-call guy is just pure lazy. The other problem might be that he and his wife made plans over the weekend and even though he was on call, maybe they slid out to do other stuff and just kind of ignored it because they were doing whatever else. Go to the beach, the pool, birthday party, whatever. But yeah, you took a job that required you to be on call, whatever frequency that is. And uh, yeah, either do your job or go to work somewhere else. That was pretty easy. A weird but easy fix. Yesterday, my assistant director gave me a heads up about a room that was reported to be having problems. The department is using that lab for a summer camp, and the director claimed none of the computers were booting. They had another room in the building as backup, but she sent over two people from our level one support to investigate. I got an email later on that afternoon that the user was waking monitors, not computers. <laughs> so she would press the monitor button, see power saving mode, and assume the computer wasn't coming on, without actually pressing power on the computers. They told me one Mac had the hard drive logo as if someone was trying to boot to another drive, but none were available. I went over there myself this morning, pressed enter on the screen it was still at, and it booted to the desktop. Restarting would bring it back to that screen, though, where you had to hit enter to go past it. I tried googling it and then realized some keys were broken. Then a light bulb came on on my head. I unplugged the keyboard and it restarted fine without interruption. For those who don't know, holding down option on a Mac keyboard will give you the option to boot to another drive that's plugged in. If no other drives are available, it'll still show you Macintosh HD as bootable drive. Plugging it back in brought the issue back, which told me one of the option keys was stuck. So I replaced the keyboard and the problem went away. I let the camp director know what the problem was and that it's working now. If any of you have been hanging around here with me for any length of time, you know that I've had some keyboard issues lately. You know, the first problem was I had a gaming keyboard. It was okay. It was, it was a little too clicky to do videos with. You know, it was cool and all, but too clicky, too noisy, a little awkward. The spacing of the keys was a little different than what I'm used to. So I gave that to one of my kids, went with another keyboard, Logitech. Logitech's been standard for me for years. It's it's always been like Old Faithful, you know. It's, it's Their equipment's always worked for me. Well, I plugged this one in and it wasn't working, wasn't working. You know, it worked for a while, but then it would start acting sketchy. Come to find out, it was the USB hub. Or so I thought. It's a powered USB hub, works great most of the time for just about anything I'm doing. The problem actually ended up being the USB on the back of the tower. That particular port is dead. I don't know why. Well, it's not dead. It's, it's just like glitchy in and out. And I've looked at the cables, so it's not the cables. It must be something in the USB port itself. So I have others, but it's kind of annoying when, you know, you're trying to figure out why your stuff's going kerflui. It wasn't a signal issue. You know, my mouse and keyboard, my keyboard's wired. My mouse is wireless and uh, they don't conflict or anything. So that's good. But yeah, keyboards are the bane of my existence this year. The overheating radar transmitter. My first job after college was at a defense contractor and I wrote software for radar systems that track domestic air traffic for collision avoidance with drones. We kept one of our radar units on the roof of the building and would hire pilots to fly around overhead so we could test the system. So test day comes around and it's usually a pretty big deal because it's a pain to coordinate with the pilots. If things don't work out, you have to wait a whole week to try again. So we power up the radar about an hour before the pilot is scheduled to fly to do a dry run of our test plan. Except that the radar won't turn on. When we put on our new code, the radar said there was a temperature error. We put back a stable software build and still the radar reports that it's too hot for operation. So my boss tells me to go to the roof to check it out, which is definitely not part of my job description, but okay. I climb up the ladder onto the roof and open the access panel to the radar transmitter. One of the electronics boards in the chassis was particularly notorious for coming loose, and when the connection was faulty, we got all sorts of strange errors. So of course that was my first suspicion. Lo and behold, as soon as I opened the hatch, I noticed something strange. Bees. Hundreds of them. They had built a nest directly over the air intake vent, and the inside of the radar chassis was a sauna. 
I think a lot of them overheated and died, but there was still plenty of them moving around and they started flying out the access panel. So I nuked the heck out of there. I told my boss that the problem was a bug after all. <laughs> I see what you did there, bug. It never ceases to amaze me how wildlife can really get in and muck up your equipment. It also will give you a concussion if you're not careful. Uh, we were building an air terminal in Georgetown, Delaware, and we had to pull some communication cables for the airport, the, the runway lights and taxi lights and things like that. So we went over to a pull box in the ground, which looks like, you know, double metal doors like you see in the city for basements in front of buildings. We opened the doors, looked down, everything seemed okay. So we jumped down in the hole to look in the, the end of the conduits where the wires were coming out. Darn if all those pipes weren't full of corn snakes. Now they're harmless. Corn snakes aren't going to hurt you, but at first glance in a semi-dark hole in the ground, a corn snake sort of reminds me a little bit of a copperhead. And I'm not real fond of any snakes. I won't kill them, but I really don't want them, you know, being in my lap. I, I came up out of that hole so fast, I slammed my head on one of the doors. And, uh, yeah, uh, I didn't go back to the hole. Well, hey, guys, I hope you enjoyed these stories. And if you did, would you consider doing me a favor? Would you click like on this video and subscribe to the channel? That would really help us out. We're trying to get to 10,000, and I think you guys are well on your way. And then, to top it all off, click that little bell icon so you don't miss the fat guy with the beard telling you stories. Oh yeah, and the next episode that I do should be from the state of Florida. I think we're going the wrong direction for July, but we'll see how it goes. See ya!